Good evening and welcome to Prime Time News. Here's a look at tonight's headlines. Sri Lanka's stance on human rights announced at the United Nations Human Rights Council. President takes the fore in revitalizing the vision of Anagarika Dharma Pala for a drug free society. Madhisaravalin, Madhravalin, Tura Samajak, Pradana Vashem, Gurnagamin, Yahapat Silachar, Hadicha, Vinegar Samajak, Gurnaganata, Obapa Siludinama, Kati Tukaramu. Prime Minister Ronald Vikramasinghe begins official two day visit to India. Any Indo Lankan misunderstanding has been government to government. A news first exclusive with Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Sri Lankan people are not the issue. If there's ever been any slippage of understanding, it has been government to government. Namal Rajpaksa and Gotabe Rajpaksa summoned before the FCID. <laughs> Post-mortem examination reveals cause of death of Seya Sadeomi. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott ousted by Malcolm Turnbull. Australia will get its fifth Prime Minister in eight years after the ruling Liberal Party voted out Tony Abbott in favour of long-time rival Malcolm Turnbull. Prime Minister Tony Abbott emerged badly weakened from a leadership challenge in February which came about after weeks of infighting and pledged a new spirit of conciliation. Abbott had earlier dismissed reports about a challenge as gossip, saying he refused to play Canberra games. I will be a candidate and I expect to win. Liberal Party Chief Whip Scott Bucoltz announced the results that showed Malcolm Turnbull, a multi-millionaire former tech entrepreneur, had won a secret party vote. The challenge came as Australia's $1.5 trillion economy struggles to cope with the end of a once-in-a-century mining boom. The big economic changes that we're living through around the, in here and around the world offer enormous challenges and enormous opportunities. And we need a different style of leadership. The change of leaders is the latest sign of political instability in Australia. Abbott has now become the shortest reigning first-time Prime Minister to be overthrown. The 30th General Session of the United Nations Human Rights Council commenced in Geneva, Switzerland today. Speaking during the high-level segment, Sri Lanka's Foreign Minister Mangala Samarira enunciated extensively on the human rights situation in the country. The 30th General Session of the UN Human Rights Council commenced at about 12.30 Sri Lankan time this afternoon under the auspices of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Said Rad Al Hussein. It is my honor to declare open the 30th session of the Human Rights Council. During his address, the High Commissioner also drew attention to Sri Lanka. On Wednesday, I will release the report of the comprehensive investigation uh, that OHCHR was mandated to conduct in March 2014, including my recommendations. Its findings are of the most serious nature. I welcome the vision shown by President Saracena since his election in January 2015 and the commitments made by the new government under his leadership. But this Council owes it to Sri Lankans and to its own credibility to ensure an accountability process that produces results, decisively moves beyond the failures of the past and brings the deep institutional changes needed to guarantee non-recurrence. The U.S. representative also spoke on Sri Lanka. The United States will engage with the government of Sri Lanka with the objective to develop a resolution that will gain the consensus support of this council and will assist Sri Lanka in achieving meaningful and credible accountability, as well as address the important findings of, the, of OHCHR's investigative report. Speaking subsequently, Foreign Minister Mangala Samaravira noted that the Sri Lankan government is committed to meaningful reconciliation. As a government that is responsible and accountable to her people, the National Unity Government remains firm in its resolve to do right by the people of the country not in the least because of assurances given to the international community at any point in time, but because this is the only path available to ensure justice, remove the causes of terrorism and achieve a durable peace for the long-suffering people in our country. 
the government of Sri Lanka recognized fully that the process of reconciliation involves addressing the broad areas of truth-seeking, justice, reparations and non-recurrence and for non-recurrence to become truly meaning meaningful, the necessity of reaching a political settlement that addresses the grievances of the Tamil people. With the mandate granted by the people, the President, Prime Minister and the government have already taken some important steps to create the conditions required for initiating a dialogue aimed at a political settlement. Defeating terrorism in Sri Lanka was a necessity. Today we have greater freedom to deal with the cause of terrorism and engage in nation building and peace building as a result of the cessation of hostilities. The armed forces of our country have been hailed in the past for their discipline and professionalism. However, the reputation of the vast majority of the armed forces was tarnished because of the system and culture created by a few positions of responsibility. Therefore, to all those who have doubts about the process of accountability, I would like to say, please don't fear. Maintain your confidence that a process of this nature would impartially observe due process and in fact help restore the good name of the Sri Lankan armed forces. Minister Samarvira noted that the government has evolved ideas for setting up independent, credible and empowered mechanisms for the truth-seeking, justice reparations and guarantees of non-recurrence within the framework of the constitution. Two mechanisms are to be established for truth-seeking by statute including a compassionate council consisting of religious dignitaries and a structure composed of commissioners. Minister Samarvira also noted that an office on missing persons based on the principle of the family's right to know would be set up by statute with expertise from the ICRC and in line with internationally accepted standards. On the right to justice, what is being proposed is for a judicial mechanism with a special counsel to be set up by statute, taking into account the right of victims to a fair remedy and aiming to address the problem of impunity for human rights violations suffered by all communities. Mr. President, today we have a government in place which acknowledges the suffering of victims across Sri Lanka's communities, a government which recognizes the mistakes of the past and is all too aware of the weaknesses of our institutions, a government that does not seek to take cover by distorting concepts and principles such as sovereignty for its own selfish ends, but instead remains firmly committed to the welfare of all its citizens, remains open to dialogue and to address difficulties and deficiencies with help and assistance from the international community when required. Therefore, I say to the skeptics, don't judge us by the broken promises, experiences, and U-turns of the past. Let us define, define, let us design, define, and create our future by our hopes and aspirations and not be held back by the fears and prejudices of the past. Let us not be lame. Let us not be afraid to engage in meaningful dialogue aimed at fighting solutions to problems as opposed to pointing fingers, heaping blames, and scoring political points at the expense of future generations. My plea to all of those who have Sri Lanka's well-being on mind, trust us and join us to work together and create the momentum required to move forward and take progressive, meaningful, meaningful and transformative steps to create a new Sri Lanka. I thank you. The 151st birth anniversary celebrations of Sri Anagarika Dharmapala was held under the patronage of President Maitri Palasirisena this morning. The event which was held at the premises of the Dharmapala College Panipitiya saw floral tributes being placed at the Dharmapala statue in the school. The national event to mark the 151st birth anniversary celebrations of Sir Anagarika Dharmapala commenced thereafter. Minister of Education Akhila Viraj Kariwasam, Western Province Chief Minister Isurudeva Priya and many others were present. Venerable Dr. Dambara Milatera delivered a special lecture at the event. Dharmapala Tuma Ida Balapurutvich Aramunu Itukaragani Mata Ekharu. I strongly believe that we are in possession of what is required to bring about the aspirations of the late Dharmapala into a reality. 
Back then, Anagarika Dharmapala said that if it's made in this country, it is from this country. However, today many of them want something from abroad and not something that is domestic. We need to create our own identity and independently uplift ourselves in order to build the nation and the country. When you take into account the quotes of Dharmapala, it is clear that most wrongdoings today were seen in the past as well. When he was in India, he had said that he will not face the direction of the uncivilized Sinhalese and sleep. He gave leadership to the non-alcoholic movement and no one else of such caliber was ever recorded after him for years. Therefore, it is our collective responsibility to revive the Buddhist vision and create a society free of intoxicants and drugs and ensure that it is civilized and law-abiding. I make this appeal from you and consider it your national responsibility. May the Triple Gem bless you. Mulu mah jati ya warga kima kota salak kamin api khati itu kerumu ikan ini lima kerumin siru dina antama teru ansar nampat kamin samugan nama istuti. Prime Minister's visit to India. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe arrived in India this evening, marking the commencement of his first state visit since assuming office. News first, Shamir Rasuldeen and Frederick Disanayaka are in New Delhi, bringing us official reports on the Prime Minister's visit. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe arrived in New Delhi this evening. He was flanked by the Minister of International Trade, Malik Samaravikrama. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mangal Samaravira, will arrive here in New Delhi tomorrow morning. During the two-day official visit of the Prime Minister, which is the first he is undertaking after being appointed as the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka following the 17th August general elections, Four bilateral agreements are to be signed with his Indian counterpart, Narendra Modi. The four agreements would be signed on the spheres of orbit frequency and MOU between India and Sri Lanka for the provision of medical equipment of 200 volts to the Bowden General Hospital and MOU regarding Indian grant assistance for the implementation of small development projects to local bodies and also a grant assistance agreement from India towards setting up of an operation of emergency ambulance service. The visit of the Sri Lankan Prime Minister is viewed as yet another step taken by the new government appointed in Sri Lanka to further the strength of relations between its closest neighbor, India. Shamir Rasuldin also caught up exclusively with former Indian diplomat and Congress Party MP Dr. Shashi Tharoor on the sidelines of the Prime Minister's visit. Mr. Tharoor, Sri Lanka has seen change. On the 8th of January, we saw a new president taking oaths. Internationally, how do you view Sri Lanka's position now? Oh, I think uh, Sri Lanka's stature in the international community has undoubtedly been enhanced by the robust assertion of its democracy. In Sri Lanka, we forget uh, sometimes because of the way in which the war crowded out perceptions of the country has actually been a remarkable success story. Some said that the international community disliked uh, former President Mahinda Rajapaksa and we saw the Congress-led government giving a cold shoulder to the previous government uh, as well. Over the last few months, have you seen a change? Whatever little differences of strategic perception or of tactical perception there might be, on the whole our interests tend to be congruent. Therefore, I don't want to overestimate or, or exaggerate the differences. There were some, some differences, but I would see them more as differences of degree rather than of fundamental differences. Now, um, certainly with the present government of Mr. Uh, Sirisena, President Sirisena and Prime Minister Vikram Singer, uh, relations are very amicable indeed and I think that um, amongst other things there is a perception in Delhi that this is a government that is very conscious of um, of India the value of India's friendship and uh, and respects that actions taken by Colombo should not be seen in any way as unfriendly to or undermining the interests of India. Both the President that is Maitri Palisir Sena and the Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh's first overseas visit has been India. What does this mean? Well, this is only natural. I mean, we are, we have so much in common and we are right next door to each other. Uh, I, I believe it's a very fine thing to do, but at the same time, I think it's a natural thing to do. You may remember the era in which every British Prime Minister, when elected, would travel first to America. And every American president, I think, uh, used to travel first to England until Kennedy went to Ireland or something. I mean, the fact is that these are natural relationships which can't just be. Uh, However, the Indian Prime Minister did not visit Sri Lanka. <laughs> he chose otherwise. <laughs> well, the Indian Prime Minister, I think, the new one, uh, had a need to establish a certain presence on the world stage and that that is uh, what guided his uh, his initial choices of destination.
Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe's visit today, what sort of avenues would that open as far as India-Sri Lanka relations are concerned? I hope all sorts of options. I mean, in a, in a relationship like ours, the complexity is in some ways quite uh, uh, simple because there is no closed door. We want, obviously, very intense economic and trade relations. The Sri Lankan government has indicated that they want to closely work with the Indian government, with its closest neighbour. However, the Indian government has not made its position clear yet. What is the position of the Indian government on Sri Lanka? Well, I'm sure it will become apparent in the course of this visit. I mean, it, there were already some very positive uh, uh, vibrations when President Sirisena came calling. And I think when Prime Minister Modi visited Sri Lanka, you all saw that there was a tremendous amount of affinity expressed. I think this visit for, by Prime Minister Vikramasinghe is likely to set the seal. Yes. Is the Indian government genuine in its interest on Sri Lanka in order to make Sri Lanka a better nation? Absolutely. You know, India is not terribly, uh, shall we say, preachy. It doesn't go around telling other countries what to do or how to do it. Uh, it, it would like to be of help uh, when Sri Lanka wants it. And it would like to be of support when Sri Lanka seeks it. And as far as Are you referring to the Sri Lankan government or the Sri Lankan people? The Sri Lankan people, as far as we're concerned, we think of as our brothers. I mean, I, I honestly don't see any uh, tension at all with the Sri Lankan people. So the Sri Lankan people are not the issue. If there's ever been any slippage of understanding, it has been government to government. Tomorrow would be a busy day for the Prime Minister and his delegation. They would meet the National Security Advisor, the Foreign Minister, the Minister of Highways and Shipping tomorrow, including the President of the Congress Party, Sonia Gandhi. News First, of course, will keep you fully up to date with regard to all the developments that will unfold from New Delhi. I'm Shami Rasuldin, reporting for News First. Now you can catch the full interview with Dr. Shashi Tharoor on Sunday at 9.30 p.m. on Biz First in Focus on MTV. Former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa and MP Nama Rajapaksa arrived at the Financial Crimes Investigation Division this morning. Acting Police Media Spokesperson SSP Priyanta Jayakudi said that a statement was recorded from Gotabe Rajapaksa over the usage of funds from the Rowlands Development Board for the construction of the DA Rajapaksa Memorial Museum. Rajapaksa refused to make a comment to the media. Nama Rajpaksa was summoned to the FCID over an allegation of money laundering. Uh, the FCID inquired over a loan obtained from a relative. I request the police to focus on preventing the string of crimes taking place in the country. They investigate the minor savings account that we had when we were going to school. Please investigate the murders of children that are taking place and find the perpetrators. <laughs> The chairman of Rakna Raksha Lanka Limited, Victor Samaravira, was summoned before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry to investigate and inquire into serious acts of fraud and corruption. I was informed that the inquiry for today was postponed to tomorrow. I cannot elaborate on that. After a clarification is provided, I will be able to elaborate on that to you. The current vice chairman of Rakna Arakshakalanka Limited, Jayant Dhanapala, expressed the following views to News First. On the Satana program on Saturday, a statement was made mentioning my name. I state that this was a false statement because I am not the chairman, I am the vice chairman. A statement was also made on Satana that I had spoken over the phone with the person known as Gotabe Rajapaksa over some matter. This too is a false statement. He has not spoken to me, neither have I spoken to him. I categorically reject that statement. <laughs> The post-mortem examination of four-year-old Seya Sadeumi has revealed that the child was molested and strangled to death. 
Seya Sadumi went missing on the 12th of this month in Kotadiniyava. The police suspected during investigations that the child would have been smuggled out of the house through an open window. The clothes the child was wearing that night were found on the bed. The body of the child was found in a paddy field 200 meters away from the house the next morning. There is a grave suspicion that this would have been committed by someone who knew the child well. The child who had fallen asleep after watching TV with her siblings on the night of the 11th of this month was tucked in by her mother. Relatives point out that the father was not at home at the time and the grandparents had returned home after attending a funeral house at 10.10 that night. They claim that the child was taken between that time and midnight when her father returned home. Those at home had gone to bed at night, leaving the main door open so the grandparents and father could enter the house. Seya Sadayumi was murdered three days before her fifth birthday. Seya Sadayumi's body was brought to her residence this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Residents of Kota Deniawa staged a demonstration today demanding justice for the child and punishment for the criminals. The demonstration was held at the Badalgama town centre. Residents of Badalgama and surrounding villages participated in the demonstration. We asked the media, the Inspector General of Police and the President to not let such incidents take place in this village or in this country and to bring the perpetrators to book. Minister of Women's and Children's Affairs Chandrani Bandara visited Seya Sadeumi's residence yesterday. We need to impose strict laws to ensure the non-recurrence of such incidents. The existing outdated laws must be abolished and strict laws must be passed with a mechanism to ensure that they are enforced. I wish to note that as the Minister of Women's and Children's Affairs, I will pursue punishment for these criminals until the very end. Former Minister Indika Gunawardena, who was an active member of the leftist movement, passed away today. He was 72 years of age at the time of his passing. Indika Gunawardena was the elder brother of the leader of the Mahajana Eksat Paramuna Dinesh Gunawardena, who is from a family which was known for carrying a legacy of leftist ideologies. The late Indika Gunawardena, who was elected to the Western Provincial Council in 1993, entered Parliament in 1994. Indika Gunawardena, who held the position of Minister of Housing and Water Supply in the Mahajana Eksat Paramana led government, was appointed the Minister of Higher Education following the parliamentary elections in 2000. The final rites will be observed in Boralugoda Avissavela on Thursday. The leader of the Tamil National People's Front, Gajendra Kumar Punnambalam, has responded to a recent statement made by ITAC leader Mave Senadi Raja, which caused much controversy. Senior journalist Jay Sri Ranga questioned Punnambalam on the matter on the popular political debate program Minna, telecast on our sister channel Shakti TV. <laughs> You know the question I posed to Gajendra Kumar Ponnambalam. He speaks about the international community. I asked him about the agreement reached with Basil Rajapaksa when LTTE members were to surrender bearing white flags. I asked him about it, but I am already aware. He swore on his mother and said, no, no, that was a lie. Why hasn't Gajendra Kumar, who played a major role, lodged a complaint against Basil Rajapaksa? This was the accusation that was levelled by Mavai Senadi Raja. I will state that this is a baseless lie. Nadesan, who is the head of the political wing, and Pulidevan, who was at the Peace Secretariat, spoke to me over the phone and said that one of their representatives would meet with me and ask me to look after the matter. The ex-LTTE political wing leader in Paris spoke to me and asked me who it was. It was Ilan Govan. He said that KP or Kumaran Padmanadan would meet me. He said that there are about 150,000 people in Mullivaikkal. He said that their lives would be destroyed. He said that they were willing to save their lives. 
He asked if I could support them. I said that I was certainly prepared to speak on their behalf. KP spoke to me directly. He said that the LTT members there, along with the 150,000 people, were willing to surrender with the mediation of the ICRC. He asked me to speak with the government about this. He told me that they believe it would be possible to speak with Basil Rajapaksa and asked me to speak with him. I spoke to Basil Rajapaksa. So it was KP who asked you to speak to Basil? Yes, it was KP who said all of that. We spoke about the matter of surrendering with white flags. He said they were not willing to do that. He said there are three important LTT members, Nadesan, Susei and Yogi, and that one of them would come out with the mediation of the ICRC and Basil and talk about the surrender. I spoke to Basil Rajapaksa about this. He spoke to the Defence Secretary and said that they were unwilling about the ICRC mediation because there were several conditions. Therefore, he said that they are willing to consider their surrender via lawyers and religious leaders. It was decided that we would speak with the bishops about this. The names of Bishop of Mana, Raya Pujosef, the Bishop in the East, King Swami Pule, and Bishop of Jaffna, Thomas Saundaranayagam, were proposed. Basil Rajapaksa, two bishops, and I went to the Vanni. Nadesan was the one who expressed willingness on the side of the LTTE to come out and speak with us. At about 11 o'clock, an announcement was made on state channels. It was said that all civilians in Mulewai Kal had been brought out by the army. They said there were around 50,000 people. It was said the rest were all LTTE members. That was the news report. As soon as I heard the news, I realized that everyone left behind would be destroyed. Then I spoke to Sambandan over the phone and explained this to him. Sambandan asked me to immediately explain this to the US Ambassador Robert Blake. UK High Commissioner Peter Haig and India's Alok Prasad. It has been revealed through WikiLeaks as well that I communicated this to Robert Blake. So Robert Blake was informed. When this was brought to the National Security Council, no one spoke about this. These foreign representatives spoke to the government. They informed me that the government said that the only option was for them to surrender with white flags. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.